Good. <clears throat> Good morning. Thank you for joining me for my daily Come Follow Me study of the Book of Mormon. Today is Friday the 15th. Finally came. And we're going to start with a daily reflection on the Book of Mormon. Behold, he offereth himself a sacrifice for sin to answer the ends of the law unto all those who have a broken heart and a contrite spirit, and unto none else can the ends of the law be answered. Second Nephi chapter 2, verse 7. The Lord asks us to repent of our sins and come unto him with a broken heart and a contrite spirit. To be broken and contrite means to be humble, to feel godly sorrow for sin, to know that without heaven's help we are lost. When we feel broken, we want to be healed, yet we cannot heal ourselves. True peace and lasting happiness come through our Savior, who offered himself as a sacrifice for sin, fulfilled the ends of the law, and gave his life that we might live. The great healer comforts our souls as we come unto him in humility and complete submission. Nephi's plea resounds in our hearts. May the gates of hell be shut continually before me, because that my heart is broken and my spirit is contrite. With broken hearts and contrite spirits, because we need to be healed and made whole, we come to our rede great Redeemer in gratitude and rejoicing. Okay, today is... Second Nephi chapter 28, and it's Nephi, it's not Isaiah, but it says, Many false churches will be built up in the last days. They will teach false and vain, false, vain, and foolish doctrines. Apostasy will abound because of false teachers. The devil will rage in the hearts of men. He will teach all manner of false doctrines. So there's like six or seven verses that talk about the proud, the, the haughty, the stiff naked, um, the, a lot, I would say half the chapter has a reference to pride or says the word pride. Um, and so you're just kind of like, okay, I could use those as an example as to why to be humble. And that is what I did. But I chose a specific one. I chose verse 15. <clears throat> oh, the wise and the learned and the rich that are puffed up in the pride of their hearts and all those who preach false doctrines and all those who commit whoredoms and pervert the right way of the Lord. Woe, woe, woe be unto them, saith the Lord God Almighty, for they shall be thrust down to hell. And my statement is just choose to be wise or this will be your fate. That's what I went with today. Choose to be wise or be thrust down to hell. Choose to be humble, not wise. Choose to be humble or this will be your fate. It's uh, clearly daylight savings is still screwing with me. But technically, it's 625 in the morning. Goodness gracious. Why am I awake? Okay. So. Let's move into our commentary. <clears throat> Okie dokie. <clears throat> okay. Let's see. Um, it's highlighting verses 4 through 12 about denying the Holy Ghost, the Redeemer hath done his work, he hath given power unto men, um, eat, drink, and be merry, false teachers, false doctrine, all that stuff. Nephi is looking forward into the future some 2,400 years and sees the present day. He is viewing with a spiritual eye with the vision of the Lord who, declared un who declares unto Moses, there is no God beside me, and all things are present with me, for I know them all. What Nephi sees is an array of misguided churches in the latter days whose constitutions and policies, 
are aptly described by the bold key words from the scriptural passage just cited. With amazing accuracy, these words characterize the ecclesiastical world in which the young Joseph Smith found nothing but confusion as confirmed for him in the voice of the Father. Uh, I was answered that I must join none of them, for they were all wrong, and the par personage who addressed me said that all their creeds were an abomination in his sight, that those professors were all corrupt, that they draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They teach for doctrines the commandments of men, having a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. As I've gotten older um, and studied the scriptures a little bit more, I've come to realize that this passage talking about many churches built up is that it's not just like the Catholic church or the you know, Protestant church or the Methodist church or, you know, uh, the church of celebrityism or the church of Hollywood, the church of TikTok, the church of global warming, the ch church of, you know, whatever you throw your beliefs into, that is a church, the church of Taylor Swift, if you will, um, the church of sports. Um, and so on and so forth. Okay. At that day shall he rage. Others will be, others will he pacify. I am no devil for there is none. Satan shall rage in the hearts of men with increasing vehem vehemence. I don't know how to say that word. In the last days, he seeks to destroy the souls of men with false doctrines and pride and by lulling them away into false security. He stirs them to anger against that which is good. He flatters them into thinking there is no devil and no hell, while stealthily leading them directly there. If, like Nephi, we could witness in visionary revelation the enormous destructive turbulence and dislocation caused by Satan when he is to rage in the hearts of the children of men in the latter days, would we not want to warn our posterity by revealing the secrets of his diabolical strategies. That is precisely what Nephi does. This portion of his record is the playbook of Lucifer exposed in plainness to all, for all to see. Nephi's strategy makes eerie sense to us today as our nation's leadership extends enormous, expends enormous amounts of time and resources to learn the playbook and, pl and plans of the terrorist groups who constantly plot the destruction of our way of life. To know and understand the enemy is to be forewarned to have insight into the enemy's tactics in the first step in overthrowing the enemy's design and in creating security for one's family. The Lord wants us to be on full alert against the incursions of evil, and Nephi is the Lord's voice on the battlefield of daily life where our chief defense is the truth of God, which is the rock upon which we can establish our stand and achieve our victory. Boom. Yeah, we'll leave it there. That was really good. Oh. What, what, what else, what else do you say? to that. You can't really say much else. Okay. Let's end the come follow me portion of this video with a daily reading on prayer. Today is Friday. It is day 75. Truman G. Madsen, Gratitude in Prayer. Joseph Smith prayed in extremity, but he also prayed in great gratitude. And here is another insight. He taught the saints that they should practice virtue and holiness, but that they should give thanks unto God in the spirit for whatsoever blessing they were blessed with. In my own life, year, yeah. in my own life years have gone by, I'm sure, when I have offered prayers, yet never spent an entire prayer simply to thank the Lord. My prayers have always had an element of asking, asking, asking. 
But Joseph taught the saints that if they would learn to be thankful in all things, simply be thankful, they would be made glorious, and their prayers would take on a deeper, richer spirit. The sin of ingratitude is one of the things that prevents us from as rich a prayer life as he had. He seemed to have an innate and deep capacity for gratitude, even for the slightest favor from the Lord as from his fellow men. And I have wept at times while reading that in his journal he sometimes wrote a kind of prayer for a brother. Bless brother so-and-so, Father, for who gave me a dollar thirty-five today to help with such and such a project. Even the smallest favor called forth his warmth and gratitude. Okay. Um, so let's move into our general conference portion of the video. Today is Friday, which is ministering day. And you know what? You know what? I got to get this one done today. This one I have to do today. Have to, have to, have to. Um, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Got to get it done. Okay. So I will do that at work, something. Yes, I have to do it today. Okay, I'm going to do it today. And then we have the Maxwell book, which honestly, I didn't read last night. It... I came over and I put my hand on the book and I just, I was like, I don't want to read this. I absolutely don't want to read this. Um, I'm having a little bit of issues with stress. Um, yesterday I, I, uh, went down to the bathroom at work and I cut my hair. Not a ton, but I cut like a couple inches off and tried to give myself some layers. Um, when I get stressed or freaked out, I do crazy things, and cutting my hair is usually one of them. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I got just a little bit off. I don't know if you can tell, but anyways. Um, so I did not read the book. I've got nine pages left in it. I'm going to try to read some tonight. I will read some tonight because I leave on Tuesday, and I've got, like, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday to finish this book, okay? Four days. I can do it. I just have to buckle down and really try hard, get over my stress and anxiety about traveling and just do it. So I'm going to do that. Um, so let's end with a read it, do it. Today is the 15th. A second Nephi chapter 28, they highlight verse 24. In the army, when a commanding officer is in the room, the soldiers are told to stand at attention. It is the opposite of being at ease. Nephi says, Woe be unto him that is at ease in Zion. Consider the message. Considering the message. Okay. All right. That is all for today. That was 2 Nephi chapter 29. And tomorrow we... 2 Nephi chapter 28. And tomorrow we do chapter 29. It will be Saturday and we will see you then. Have a great day. Talk to you later. Bye.